Good morning, good morning. God bless you all. Good morning, good morning, good morning. So good to see each and every one of you this morning. In the name of the Lord, Father, we are so grateful for your people and for this time that we have gathered together this morning to share the word of God. Amen. We pray that all is well, that everyone slept well, that things are going well in your life. Amen. We welcome those on our Facebook page as well as those on our Instagram page. Welcome to the Whole Life Community Church web, I mean, uh, Morning Manor. God bless you all. So good to see you guys. Good morning, uh, Minister Yolanda. God bless you. Again, we thank God for seeing you guys this morning. Amen. Good morning, Sister Jackie. Amen. So good to see you. I pray that all is well with you and your daughter. Amen. God is such a good God. Amen. He's a keeper. He's a comforter. Amen. Good morning, cuz. Good morning, Sister Turner. Amen. God bless you guys. Amen. We ready to get started and sharing the word. We got an exciting word. Good morning, Mother Pat. I pray all that is well with you. Amen. That you guys are taking care of yourselves. God is so good. And we have a good lesson this morning. Very good lesson this morning. Good morning, Pastor Smith. God bless you. Tell Pastor Antoine I said hello. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Sister Samia. Good morning, Sister Tammy. Amen. Greet everybody this morning. See, one thing about the virtue of uh, 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 sharing, amen, uh, except for me, you don't have to look your best, amen, and you can just greet each other, amen, it's important that we take, don't take each other for granted, amen, because nothing is promised in life, amen, that we should always love each other, um, and not just in this time, but all the time, and, you know, life is really, really precious, it's like a, a vapor, amen, it's here today, gone tomorrow, amen, that's the unfortunate thing, good morning, Sister Latifah, amen, we're glad that you're doing well, amen. Sister Latifah has some of the funniest stories on her job. She reminds me of a friend of mine who, uh, she's in, in Newark and she had a, uh, <laughs> she wrote two books called Bus Chronicles and she, she kind of journeyed her, 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 her trips on the bus and the adventures that she had and sometimes uh, Sister Latifah, uh, stories that she have, you know, some horrible, but then there's some that's very humorous as well. We thank you for sharing that this morning. As you guys know, amen. Uh, we're going to be talking from the book, I believe it's from Luke. Yeah, it should be from Luke. Amen. That's featured, even though it's throughout the gospel. Yeah, Luke 10 and, and 38 through 42. Amen. Good morning, Sister um, Deacon Gale. Good morning, Sister Debbie. Amen. So glad to have you guys with us this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about that one thing, that one thing. Amen. Even though, you know, there's a lot of things, there's that one thing. And it's part of the conversations that I've been having over the last few weeks, of course, is about prioritizing things and what's important and how you're going to do this. Everybody's making a checklist to, to make sure what they're doing is right. Um, especially as we, I got to echo somewhere in here. Got to figure out where is that. Amen. Um, to make sure that things are right, that we're, what we're doing, um, that we're on the right, we're on the right page. Amen. Amen. So again, if you have your Bibles, go to the book of Luke, the 10th chapter. We're going to start at the 38th uh, verse down to the 42nd verse. Amen. Good morning, Brother James. Amen. Don't forget to share. Don't forget to uh, uh, invite your friends to be a part of this. Uh, again, uh, this is the way you want to start your day. This is the way you want to get going uh, with, with, with the Word of God so that it could be a blessing to you and strengthen you throughout your day. Amen. Um, I'm grateful to God. And it's funny because like everybody says, it's like now we come today, yesterday, and tomorrow. You forget what days of the week that it is that's going on and uh, going on around. Amen. Um, and today at noon, today at noon, uh, our first lady will give us our strength at noon at 12 o'clock. Strength at noon. So please join her at that time. Amen. So in the book of Luke, the 10th chapter and the 38th verse, and the reason is why it says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. In the 40th verse, it says, but Martha was distracted by all the preparation that was made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Jesus replied, Martha, Martha. The Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed and indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken from her. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your reading here in the book of Luke, the 10th chapter. We thank you, word, because your word is life. Your word is a means, is hope. God, we thank you that you have spoken to us today through this particular chapter, this particular verses, that you should give us directions in that manner that we need this morning, that we may make it, that we may be strengthened in whatever we do. 
We thank you, God, as you open up our hearts and minds to receive what it is that you have for us, each of us individually, God. Even though we've come together collectively, we know there's a word that you have just for us in this day. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen and amen again. We welcome you guys. Thank you for being here. Our focus today, the main story is, is Mary of Bethany. Bethany. And we're going to talk about Bethany just briefly, what type of place it was and what it meant and things of that nature. But the focus today is really on serving God. Involves It involves activity and worship. Both are needed for balance. But Jesus commended Mary because she was ready to worship with humility. It's, it's great to serve. It's great to be busy. It's great to be in activity. And many times we have a lot of activities that we're doing. A lot of times we're doing a lot of church stuff, but we're not doing stuff that God has directed us to do. Amen? Amen. I'm trying to figure out why well, I got an echo in here somewhere. I can't figure out. It may be up here. Amen. It's when you're your, your own sound guy. Makes it a little bit difficult. Amen. Maybe that's it. Hopefully, let's see what happens with that. Amen. So when it comes to that, we want to make sure that one thing, it says the 10th verse in the 42nd, I'm like 10th chapter and the 42nd verse. It says, but one thing is needful. One thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that good part, which shall not be taken from her. She's chosen that good part that shall not be taken from her. Again, good morning to each and every one of you. God bless you. Amen. Good morning, Brother Rob, Sister Bodie. God bless you all. Amen. I see my great nieces and my great cousins, my second, third cousins. You know, we have second, third cousins. Amen. Amen. Thank you for tuning in. And, um, you know, we do a lot of things that, that are involved, like I said, activities and worship. Now, what would happen in this scenario? Jesus stopped by because these were his friends. Mary, Martha, and as we know, even Lazarus was his friend. So he stopped off in this place called Bethany. Bethany was probably about 10 to 15 miles away from Jerusalem. Bethany was not the best place. It was considered, actually, it was a word that I had written down about it. It was known as the, the house, the house of misery. Can you imagine being known as the house of misery? Because a lot of people, a lot of people who had gone there were people that was invalid. They were, they were handicapped, they were disabled. So it wasn't, a, a, in a sense, a positive place. It wasn't a rich place, but it was a place that was gone. And one of the things that let us know in this type of scenario is that God is not concerned about the condition and he's concerned about your conditions, but it's not something that impedes him or stop him from coming into your house. Just because someone may have a, live in a mansion does not mean God will come to somebody that may live in a one bedroom or flat or a one bedroom, a one bedroom apartment. It's, it's all about if it's conducive for where he's going to be. Amen. So he stopped by to see his friends in Bethany. Amen. Which again was about, it was two miles away from him. And for God, it's not important. It's not important to him. The status of where you live. It's not important to the status where you live. What's important is the status of your heart towards him. That's the first thing we got to recognize. It's about your status of your heart towards him. And as I've been talking to people over the last few days, last few weeks, one of the things that we realize that it's really about the intent of someone's heart. It's really about the intent of someone's heart as far as uh, how God works with them and how God moves with them as well. Amen. So we want to talk today about one was one sister was busy doing work around the house. You know, you got people that's busy in the church. You know, it is funny because as we talk about this and we talk and we talk about church, because you could be busy. <laughs> You could go to church every day, every day, but yet your heart has not changed. So it's not about your attendance. It's important that you attend. It's important that you gather together because the Bible tells us to forsake not to assemble ourselves. Because even now, even though we're not physically in one location, we're, we're, we're physically and emotionally in the same place. Amen? Um, so it's telling us not to do that. But if church just become a habit, but it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not how your heart lives, it, it does not, it's not as important. Is, 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 is okay, it's important, it's necessary, but it's not as important. That's, that's what the point I'm trying to make. So, so today I want to talk about the one sister was more focused on what was important, but she missed what was necessary. It was important that you clean the house. It was important that you prepare the food. All that's important. What you do in ministry is important. What you're doing, you know, but, but you're missing what's necessary. I remember a story years ago. Uh, it was at Highway on 10th Avenue. We had a brother named Brother Deacon Freddie. Deacon Freddie was a diligent brother, faithful brother, committed brother, loved the Lord with all his heart and everything. Always wanted to do the right thing. Humble brother. Amen. And there was a snowstorm. 
And one of the things they did, I believe, I forget the time they did the prayer. It was before Bible class. Say it was it was it was eight o'clock, nine o'clock, they did the prayer every morning, faithfully did the prayer. Prayer, prayer is important. Prayer beyond a doubt is important. And this is kind of the, the flip side of it. And he got in the, he got to the church, he climbed over the snow, he got inside there, he started praying. And when when the bishop got there, he realized that Brother Freddie was inside, but the front of the church had not been shoveled. None, the people couldn't get in. Now, that's the flip side. Prayer is important. But at that time, what was necessary was the work. See, we think worship, and worship is at the feet of Jesus. It is humbly pursuing ourselves before Jesus. But sometimes, when the, the shoveling the snow was probably the more necessary thing that was needed at that time. Prayer, yeah, that's, that's important, and it is necessary. But you got to, when it comes to priorities, we got to be led by our heart and not by our habits. Got to be led by our hearts and not by our habits because you could do things. Think about the man that was going down the road. Uh, he was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. He was going from, and this is the story about the Good Samaritan. This is the, the, about the Good Samaritan. Good morning, Pastor. God bless you, my brother. So good to see you here this morning. It, it, it's, it's really, I'm sorry, it could be system, my fault. <laughs> so, God bless you, Pastor. I'll leave it at that. Amen. Good to have you with us. Um, and it was, he was going down to the road to Jericho, which tells you you're going from Jerusalem to Jericho, which is not always good because Jericho was a den of thieves. J Jerusalem was the city of God. And along the way, he was robbed. And he, was, he was robbed by some robbers. And there was a few people that came by, a priest came by, and he looked at the other side of the road. And he said, you know what? I got to go take care of the temple. A Levite, who's an assistant to the priest, came by and crossed to the other side. But then a Samaritan came um, I believe it was Samaritan. Yeah, Samaritan came and helped him up and took him to the took him to an inn and told the innkeeper, "Listen, I'm going to leave you some money for this person, and I'm going to leave my, my donkey here so that this person can be taken care of. And here's some extra money just in case." That's what a good neighbor is. That's that's what a good neighbor is. Those are the things about priorities that we got to get together. And again, I'm going to relate it to what we're going through right now because we're in this. I got your attention. I got your conversation. I thank God for my brother all the way from Georgia, Brother John. Um, this is my friend from childhood. He was on yesterday. Thank you, John, for logging back in, being with us this morning. Amen. Me and John go back, way back, way back. I love that brother. Love that brother. So when we talk about serving God, serving God, which is important. I was on a call yesterday and, and Brother Jason was saying a few things. He said, Pastor Odom does this, Pastor Odom does that. And we talked about a lot of things. But he mentioned about being an adjutant. And to me, that's one of the most important things for me is being an adjutant, being a servant, being able to serve the men and women of God to help move the program forward. Because sometimes it's not about you. It's not about your title. It's about what you can do to advance the kingdom. And, and many times, if you look throughout the Bible, when we talk, when we talk about ordinary people. You don't always have to have a big title. You don't have to have a lot of degrees. All those things are honorable and they're needful and all those things. But it may not be the most important thing. Because these, some of these things will not get you into heaven. These things will not uh, make your relationship with God more valid. It's about the intent of the heart of the person. So that's, that's really two aspects of serving. Um, to remind you of the story of the woman that Jesus met at the well. Remember the woman that Jesus met at the well? Again, this was a Samaritan woman. And, and he met her at noontime. And not to go too much into that story. But this woman only came there because of her reputation. She came there and there was not a time that you would want to come to the well because it was high noon, it was hot, but because of her background and because of what people said about her and, and her reputation, she had to come at this time, not when the other women came, which was normally in the morning. So she came when nobody else was there, but it was a setup for Jesus to have a conversation with her. And in the conversation, she questioned, why are you talking to me? Because we have no dealings. We normally don't have any dealings. And she said, because you guys worship this way and we worship that way. Now their way of worshiping was not always incorrect. And that's something we want to understand. And, and that's something we're discovering. A lot of times we have separation, even when it comes to church, even in the same culture, in the same neighborhood, because you believe in wearing this and I don't believe in wearing that. You believe in doing prayer this way. I believe. And sometimes we, we, we put emphasis on things that are not really important. What's really important is what getting to God. It's just like there may be some people that believe a certain way. Maybe they're Islam. Maybe they're, they're a Jehovah Witness. Whatever they are, right? Now, ecumenically, which means we come together, we believe that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. We may not come to agreement, which is a very, very important matter. But in a time like today and what's going on in our communities and things like this, this is when we got to get shoulder to shoulder with our brothers 
because they're still our brothers one way or another and deal with our community. Now, we may not be able to sit down and have worship together, but you got to understand in that moment what's important because together we could get more done. Amen? Together we get more done. So it's very important that we recognize this because it talks about when Jesus spoke to this woman, this Samaritan woman, and revealed the knowledge of her sinful life, they want to discuss matters in place of worship. Amen? And they talk about geographical locations. Oh, my God. There's a conversation taking place tonight with Pastor De um, Derek from Ladder Glory that we're going to have. And we're going to talk about the game has changed. And this is going to be an important part of it. Geographical location is going to change. So some things we're going to have to get, um, we're going to have to get comfortable with. Church may not be church as normal. And, and part of my conversation with him is you're going to have to create your new norm. Don't allow somebody else to create your new norm. You're going to have to create your new norm, even as pastors. So we got to think outside the box. We got to think outside of tradition. I love tradition. I love doing certain things. And you may be able to incorporate those things. But how do I move forward in this? What about your personal life? I'm quite sure you have revisited some things because just like in 2006, 2007, when the economy hit rock bottom with the housing issue, there was a lot of things we were not prepared for because we did not have our priorities in place. Now, many states are talking about, in Georgia as well, brother, don't you go get no haircut, John. You shave your own hair. Do what you got to do. Don't go out there. If we got to look rough, we got to look like Risley Adams, we got to look like Risley Adams. But it's, an, it's, it's, it's important that we get a haircut. It's important that we get our nails done. But it's the most necessary thing to do. Or it's about protecting yourself and using wisdom in these things. Everybody's agenda is not the same. And that's why it makes a difference how we move. That's why we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Amen. So he talked about it's different because he said God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit and in truth. See, see, this, see, see one sister decided, yes, cleaning up is great, but the Messiah is here. Jesus is here. That's why if we're in church, <laughs> if we're in church and we're in service, I don't want someone running around when it's prayer time. I don't want you running around when it's worship time. And I know a lot of pastors do this. I don't do this because I love to worship. Some, I don't know if it's tradition, they're waiting for certain things to happen. And this is no shade on anybody. They'll lay back in the office while praise and worship is going on. They'll lay back in the office. I don't know if they're preparing things. This is what we, they do. I, I don't know what their reason is for doing it. That's, that's their choice. But I choose to be when service starts. I want to be in the worship of the service. So I want to be in when it's there. It doesn't make something wrong. It doesn't make something right. But for me, that's really necessary because I don't need you to be busy running around. I don't need you checking this. This is why we come in early. I'm supposed to come in early to get these things done so that the drummers can worship. You should be tuning up. The singers should be in worship. You know, the ushers should be in worship. Everybody should be in worship. And I'm going to share a story. And this is a personal conviction of mine because you know you grow up a certain way. <laughs> You grow up, and this is a good story. God, sometimes God's not fair. He give you nuggets, and, and they, they they convict you. I remember, and it was it was Christ Church. I'm gonna tell you what church it was. It was Montclair Christ Church. David, Doctor David Ireland. I went there for a, a summit or a conference or something. And back then, we we really didn't believe we really didn't believe in and and women wearing ear, um, earrings. We did not, and it wasn't that far long ago. And we didn't believe in women wearing earrings. God forbid a man wore earrings. You know that was out. That was out. We didn't believe in women wearing earrings. So I walk into this church. People are wonderful. They're beautiful people. They're, they're sweet. They're greeting us. And then as I'm going to the front, to the back, a gentleman comes and he's coming to usher me to my seat. Now, as he come, he has an earring in his ear. Now, here I am, my, my, my holy, supposed to be holy self, look at this earring as an indication that this man don't love God. But I'm missing the point. Here's two things I missed. As I'm walking to my seat, he's taking me to my seat. Worship is going on. He's ushering me and worshiping God at the same time. But here I am in judgment of his earring, not realizing that this man is doing what he's like. First of all, he's serving in the church and he's worshiping God. That earring has nothing to do with the condition of his heart, uh, his relationship with God. I mean, and the Holy Spirit didn't let me go too far. When I got to my seat, the Lord convicted me right then and there. Who are you? How are you judging man earring? And again, eventually we got the understanding. This is something that was passed down to us. And it's something that we use. Even I remember my son being in first grade and he was going to highway church in New York. And he came home one day and he told, he said he told his friend that his mother was not saved because of how we believe at that time. 
He says, mother wouldn't say. When we say, well, how are you going to say? Now you're talking about somebody that's three, four years old. How are you going to tell his mother? Because she was wearing pants. That thing convicted me to my heart. That thing convicted me to my heart. Bishop G.E. Patterson preached a message, and I think some people have played it a couple of days ago uh, it, cause, because of the Clark Sisters um, uh, documentary that came out, and the mother talked about you can't come in this house with pants because that is what we believed in. We made that more important than the necessary of their heart, the person's heart. That's why we have to be careful when someone comes to your church door that you don't look at them at your natural eye, but you, you believe God for what's in them. Amen. I don't care if they got piercings, they got tattoos. I don't care if they smell like reefer, they smell like whatever. They're in the house of God. That's what's necessary at that time. That is what needed to be done. That They need to be in the house of God, receiving the word of God. Sometimes we look and we want to see change in people. It is not up to us. It's up to us to give them the word and let the word work on their heart. Let God, let God work in the heart because you can have an outward appearance. We talked about the priest and the Levite who was on their way to the temple, but they saw there was a person that was in need and they walked right past that person when what was necessary at that point was to help that person. Who's the good neighbor? Who's the same one? I don't care how much church knowledge you have. I don't care how much Bible you know. Your heart has got to be in the right place because when it comes to being a Christian, we got to know what's acceptable in God's economy. What's acceptable in God's economy? Those are the things. The opportunity to worship God is the most important thing. And see, worship is from the heart. Worship is not the moving of the hands. It's not the moving of your lips as though there's something going on there. But it's about the heart matter. It's one-on-one -on -one with God. It's not about the audience. And listen, I am the worship leader in my church. I am the worship leader. You are not going to out-worship me. I don't play an instrument. I cannot sing, but I can worship. And worship is about the condition of your heart and how I view God. I'm going to worship God with every chance I get. I'm going to worship God in my car. I'm going to worship God in my job. And I worship him through how I live, how I act, how I treat people. That's how I worship and honor God. Amen, somebody. So you can have an activity, which was really Martha's spirit. You could be doing activities and someone's been busy. And, 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 and let, me, let me say this. Let me say this. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Some people say they've suffered, and I can say they did not. Let me just put the preferences the right way. You know, they say about church hurt. We say about church hurt, but then how did you get hurt? We were probably most likely disappointed in some form of leadership. We were probably disappointed from people that was in charge, could have been disappointed by the pastor, something you've seen, something that has happened that disappointed you and someone you put more stock in. And a lot of times, the reason why we suffer a lot of times from church hurt, because we got a lot of activity going on. You got a lot of activity. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you involved. Yeah, you do this. You teach Sunday school. You usher. Uh, uh, you greet on certain Sundays. Uh, you do this. You do that. You read the scriptures. Yeah, you're doing a lot of activity, but your worship. What is your worship? See, your activity. See, see Martha's spirit was activity, right? But, more, but Mary's was worship, and worship is a choice. Worship is a choice. That's why when the praise and worship team get up and they tell you, lift it, they should not have to tell you to lift your hands to God. When you come in, you should be lifting your hands. You said you enter into his gate with thanksgiving into his court with a praise. Don't just say that, be that. Amen. So a lot of times we have a lot of customs. We have a lot of customs. <laughs> and, I, and I thought about this. A lot of customs and a lot of traditions that, that are subject to, to scrutiny. I would, we should revisit some things that we do. And sometimes it's hard. When I've had friends who have gone and say they became the pastor, there was an existing ministry. There are certain things you cannot just go in and just change. And I mean, that's just being honest. That's being wise as well. Because some of these things mean something to these people. It means something to these people, but it may not mean anything to God. Let me say that again. It means something to these people, but it don't mean anything to God, or as much to God. There was one church where I think something happened, and they had a bell in the lobby. It was a bell in the lobby. And, and they loved this bell. It was there for years, down through the years. And they were trying to do some expansion. And the pastor explained to them, that, you know, if we move this bell to another location, and we still going to have it here because y'all love this bell, we, it'd be better. No, we, we, we not doing it. And they were fighting the pastor on that. But even though logistically he was trying to make things better, they were fighting him on these things. We have to choose the things that, that matter. And here's the thing with any tradition, and it's the God on his truth. I don't have a problem with you having a tradition. I do not have a problem. Whatever tradition you have, this is what we do first Sunday. We do it third Sunday. You know, X, Y, and Z. If you look at it, you don't know why we do it, the origin of it. But don't make it as though God said it. And that's what probably the problem was. There were certain things that was, that was, that was done or was made as rules instead of principles. Because we have more rules when we should have principles. And the reason why it's harder because if a principle becomes a part of your life, 
A rule be something I have to be aware of. I have to always measure myself again. But I want the principle. I want certain principles to be part of my life. Because there are certain things that people who don't claim or call on the name of Christ won't do that churchgoers will do. Because they have certain principles. They may not have a spiritual relationship, but they have certain principles in their life that they will not violate. There are certain things they will not do. But worship is a choice. Nobody can force you, even though they encourage you to worship. You have to choose to worship from your heart. It's a matter of the heart. So when it comes to things at church, Martha was consumed with her busyness that, that, that affect her attitude. As a matter of fact, if you go back to the scripture, go back to the scripture. Now I want to use this. If you look at 10 and 40, look at that word, the 10 and 40. It says, but Martha was cumbered. And this is in the King James Version. She was cumbered about much serving. In other words, that word means to be obsessive, obsessive. And we can get to that point where we become obsessive about something. Oh, I got to do this. Oh, I got to do this. And the whole time you walk past God, say, excuse me, God, I got, I got, to, go to, I got to open this up. God, I got to go do this. I got to do that. We got to get our priorities in place. And as I was saying, in this pandemic, we've had time on our hand. And we realize we have not been as productive. Oh, my. That's the word I was looking for. That's the word I was looking for. You got we, we We're not as productive. You're busy. But you're not productive. You're doing a lot and you're tired. You pass out at the end of the day. And when you look back over and you look at your list, you're like, I got nothing done. I got nothing done because you're not productive. I, I've developed some things in my life and I'm still working on Mother Johnson. And they call it they call rhythms. I try to develop rhythms in my life because I have a lot going on. Now, I'm scaling back a whole lot. Trust me when I tell you. I'm scaling back a whole lot of a whole lot of things. I'm not going to overextend myself because I know me. I, I did. I, I dive into something, and, I, and when I dive into it, I'm 100 percent in. You got to know your makeup. You got to know your makeup. That's why some people will say, uh, "Could you come to this meeting? Could you be a part of this?" And I'll flat out say no, because I know me. If I get involved, I'm going to be involved. I'm not going to go in halfway. I'm going all the way. I'm, I'm going to go in. I'm going to look. I say, you know what? You know, we could fix this, and you know, I'm going to suggest you do this. So that's why I'm very careful because before I know it, I was working on two projects. Now I'm working on ten. You have to develop rhythms in your life. And, and, and I used to be one when they used to have the date, the daytime of books and all that. I hated writing stuff down like that. But now we have technology. I made to make things cross platform, make it happen. It helps me to stay on track. I thank God for our administrative team. I thank God for our leadership team. Uh, I'm not that, I'm telling you, I'm not that important, but I'm busy. And in order to move ministry, in order to, and when I say ministry, I'm not talking about the preachment. I'm talking about the people. I'm talking about to get the vision across, not my vision, but God's vision for this part of the vineyard, this team. And that's why it's important to have a team because there's accountability as well. Sometimes they remind me, I get, get reminders passing. What about this? Sister Yolanda, Minister Yolanda started sending me this little red thing on my phone. I kept saying, what is this thing? It's an alarm. And she sends it to remind me of certain things. But I'm looking, I'm like, it looked like a, 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 a red dot. So it helps me to remind me to do certain things. So you need people to hold you accountable. Keep people to, to remind you what's really important. That's why, and, and, and I kind of looked down on it a little bit when it first came out, because I thought we was kind of crossing over. When the term a life coach or a spiritual coach came about, and, you know, because it was new, and this again, this is why we have to examine certain things. Don't always frown upon them because you look at that. Oh, well, we never did that before. Okay. We never used to talk through a telephone either, did we? Or look through a telephone and watch a service on a telephone. Amen. Now, that sounds 20, 30 years ago. That sounds, it sounds insane. But you got to look at things new. And so I'm saying about a coach and understanding between a mentor, a coach, and a counselor. A mentor is someone who mentally pulls into you. A counselor is someone who walks alongside of you. A coach is someone who pulls out what's already in you. So to have a life coach to help you manage your life, to have a fitness coach is to help you manage your fitness. To have a spiritual coach, which is basically a pastor or a spiritual leader to help you bring out what it is. Sometimes I got to coach you. Sometimes I got to mentor you. Sometimes I got to counsel you. But I got to know in what's important in that moment as well. Amen. So a lot of times when we have a business and human matters, it's because we lack Spiritual discernment and spiritual growth. At the same time, our busy schedule may promote carnality and develop what is known as a pride of performance. A pride of performance. What's your intent? What's your motivation? What do you, why do you do what you do? A pride. Now, now, let me say something. Outside of the church, sometimes we suffer from that. We have 
what I call performance-based salvation. Because I'm busy. Because you always see me at the church. Don't mean I'm more spiritual than anybody else. Right, Sister Sherry? Does not mean I'm more spiritual. And, and I think this is what caused people sometimes to be confused about church and church people. Honestly. I mean, this is, you know, I'll be honest with you. This is because they always at the church. They always with the pastor. They always doing X, Y, and Z. But they mean is the devil. That, 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 see, that, see, being in the church and carrying titles, and that's another thing. I, trust me, I have nothing against titles. I have nothing against them. But from the outside of looking in, it said, if you are a mother, if you are an evangelist, if you're X, Y, and Z, now we're not, none of us are perfect. God knows we're not perfect. Amen? But it cannot be what you're known as. You can't be known as a person that's mean spirit. You can't be a person, oh, don't mess with her or mess with him because they will go off on you. That cannot be your reputation. If you become unapproachable, you can't be so, <laughs> I had a brother and he had all good intentions. He really did. He was a great brother. He loved God. He was saved for real. He was saved. He loved Jesus for real. But he was so stern. He was like, always a sour looking, but he wasn't mad. He wasn't mean. It was just his demeanor. But I had to work on him with that because I said, bro, you are someone that people need to come to and you appear to be unapproachable. You appear to be unapproachable. So we got to be careful how we present ourselves as well. We got to be careful of our mood swings being up today and up to tomorrow. Now you're in the church, <laughs> you're doing the work of God, you're feeding the homeless, you're clothing the, the naked, you're doing all this, you're visiting the sick, you're doing all this stuff, but you, it's a performance-based salvation. You're doing it for merits. You're doing it to be seen. You know, you're going back and forth. So we got to be careful that our busyness don't promote a pride of performance. There are too many activities in our lives, especially in the church, that are important and necessary, but activity of work can never save us. Moreover, we have, we, we, if we are not careful, they can hinder our salvation experience. Busyness can hinder your salvation experience. I tell the brothers, because this is easy to do. It's easy to do. And, and, and all my pastors out there, I want you to hear what I'm saying. Especially when it comes to men. Especially when it comes to men. Especially when it comes to men. Men are different from women when it comes to their worship experience in a lot of ways. A lot of times, one of the reasons that men are not as active or involved in church is because of the fact that it's an emotional invasive place. And a lot of times, depending on their makeup, they're not comfortable in that. And again, because there's a majority of women, and trust me, I thank God for the women because if it wasn't the women in church, we had nobody in church. Amen? But a man sometimes feeling a sense of belonging, a sense of belonging is by being busy, having a responsibility, putting his hand to do something, a sense of accomplishment. Especially, I must say, for African-American men, especially our older men who's from the South, if they're not working, my God, if they're not busy, they feel like they're worth nothing because that's all we've been taught. If you're not working, if you're not doing something, don't let them get sick. That's why they will go to work sick. That's why they won't go to the doctor. That's one of the reasons. It, they won't go to the doctor because I cannot miss work. If I can't miss work, I can't provide my family because that is what makes me a man. It's, and then we take that same attitude in the church. We get busy. That's why I tell the brothers like, okay, let me see your schedule. You're doing sound this day, this day. No, you're not doing sound. You got to be in the, You got to be in the audience. You got to be with your family. You got to be, because you, see, you're not growing spiritually. Because a pastor approached me one time, and he was concerned, because he had a lot of good brothers that came from the street, that was at his ministry, and they were doing work in the ministry. But he said, these brothers are carnal. And they ain't as carnal. They in sin. Why are they not growing? And I said, because they're not developing spiritually. Yes, they're on duty. They're doing security. Yes, they're ushering. Yeah, yeah, you're adjutant. But when is their spiritual activity? When are they not involved and what's going on in the church. Let me tell you something. When I go to a church and nobody knows me, I don't want to do nothing. I want to go and receive the word. I'd rather go to a, 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 a Asian church where someone's up there interpreting and I can get it because I don't want to be concerned. And let me tell you something. And I'm telling you, my pastor's friend can relate to this. Even when you go to somebody's church and you're not judging, you're like, well, well she should be over there doing that. She, because you're used to being the pastor. I thank God, and I did this very intentionally, and I learned this from Bishop Page II. Part of my job as the pastor, not part of my, my main job on a Sunday morning is to preach the gospel. That has to be my focus. It has to be my focus. So you have to surround yourself with people in the team that you trust and you can develop, amen, that can get the job done. I shouldn't have to come and check this out. I shouldn't have to come and do Now, if I have to, I will. And trust me, they won't let me anyway. So I, I, you're making sure this is in place. You put things in place to help to help things be where they need to be. Amen? And if they're not, you have checkpoints. 
Uh, Sister Yolanda is our protocol officer, which basically means she kept doing checkpoints for everybody. How are we doing with the ushers? How are we doing this? Now, the usher presidents, the sound, all of those, they know they have timelines. And we do this not to be robotic, but to make sure there's a flow. It's all about the flow, that the presence of God can flow, all that other stuff. Now, when we start our service, and, and I chose this because for certain reasons, we, we have our scripture reading, we have our prayer before that, we have our scripture reading, we have a prayer to open up, the invocational prayer, we have praise and worship, and I get up. Because at that point, we had the word, we had, we had the prayer, we had worship, here come the word. There's no human intervention. Now, you pray that none of those things interfere before the word comes, because you want the word to flow. Now, we can do the offering at the end. That's why I chose to do it that way. You do the offering at the end, so there's no interference. We do an announcement at another point, so there's no interference. It may be the announcements why I'm up, but you don't want a lot of flesh on parade. Flesh of, you want to help things flow. So we got to be careful that our activities and the things that we do are, are productive and, and they're towards God and they're honoring God. Amen? And, and one other point, Mary attitude of worship gave her a special place in the scripture. There are two portions, this is important. With Martha, it's very important. There's two places where she sat at his feet. Remember, he said the first is observed when she sat at, she sat at Jesus' feet as he spoke in Martha's house. Then in John 12 and 3, the scripture recorded that she anointed Jesus' feet and head with precious ointment. She wiped his feet with her hair in an extraordinary act of devotion. Jesus was so moved at the act that he, he said her sacrifice will be forever remembered in the gospel. And the reason why we talk about that oil... That oil was worth, I want to say, a year or more wages. It was precious ointment. It was precious oil that she knew that in that moment, you know, and 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 and, and, we, and she was a, he was about to die. So part of the, the procedure of a person passing on was that they anointed their body. He knew that her sacrifice. She knew that the sacrifice. She like they said, you don't know how much this oil cost me. Tell somebody you don't know how much this oil cost me. You don't owe how much me being where I am today cost me. Now, I may not have a big house. I may not have a lot of cars, but this anointing cost me something. That to, to, in order to get the oil out of something, Brother John, that in order to get the oil out of olive, it has to be crushed. It means it had to go through a process. It had to, something had to be extracted out of it. And we have gone through some things. We have gone through some things in life. And, and, and I will not allow anything in anybody to move me from this anointing. My anointing is not an ability to teach or preach. It's not my anointing to, to sing and do these things. My anointing is to be how I am able to live and honor, honor God in my worship. That's my anointing because whatever I have is not worth not worshiping God. My suit, my makeup, my hair, whatever it is, my, my time, it all belongs to God. His words. I worship him in my house. I worship him in my car because he's worthy. God, that's what worship is about. How I value him. Even though she had this oil that had a value and she could have took it and used it for something else. Think about even with, with, with uh, who betrayed him. Uh, not, okay, oh, can't think of the man's name. The one that betrayed God. When he betrayed God, he was concerned about the money that was being used. He was a treasurer. He was concerned about the money that was being used more so than the work that needed to be done. Amen. Amen. That's right. What did y'all don't know? Tell somebody, y'all don't know what this oil cost me. My God, my God, I can shout and praise God right there. You don't know what this oil, like I said, I don't look like what I've been through. And I ain't some phrase or something we just say. I do not look like what I have been through. There is no way. It does, there's no way. So, so, so what God does, and from God's view, God does not condemn activities. He does not condemn. He wants us to be workers in the church. He wants us to do that. We've got to keep things in priority, keep perspective. Let me say this as well. Take care of your home. Make sure your home is good. Amen? Make sure your home is good. Don't be so busy with ministry. That's why I promise you, a lot of things I do, I'm, I'm very intentional as a pastor outside of the regular stuff. I don't want to overburden. And now I say overburden. The reason why? Because balancing. People with so much church services that it's taken away from their home life. Perhaps the spouse is not saved. Perhaps the children don't understand how many pastors' children have grown up and felt like the church has robbed them of their pastor, their father, and their mother because of the busyness. And I'm be honest, a lot of us busyness. What we have to do, we got to have. We don't have to have quality. We have to have quality. We have to have quality of service when we go. 
That's when I tell you when you come to church, give your all in all. I'm very intentional about cycling and, and incorporate rhythms into the life of the church and habits into the people to make sure. If we're doing Wednesday and we have Friday for our ministries, please attend those services. That's why I say attend them. And that's why I do it. If you're with the women's ministry for the most part, you're going to be there once that month. And even we find that there's an overlap where it's causing you to be out the second one because that's a, the men's. We try to keep balance and help you with balance. Because what good is it for you to gain the whole world and lose your soul? What's the good you to win the whole nation and lose your family? Keep balance. When doing football season, if, if you got your kids got a football game, we say go. Alternate with your husband. We understand in that season. But yeah, you're going to run into the problem with people taking advantage of but that's between them and God. But I don't ever want to be one as a pastor, spiritual leader. That's why we hold life. Because you, that family got to be okay too. I don't want them not liking God because you were so busy. I, uh, you didn't attend my recital. Come on. Come on. We got, we got, we got, we got, we got to use wisdom in these things. Amen? And we're going to say, we can't, we can't say we're saving the family and destroying the family and separating the family all at the same time. So again, the Lord does not condemn activity, but commends worship as being more important. Worship is more important. Here's why worship is so important. It is a condition of your heart towards him. Now we talk about praise and we talk about worship. We talk about praise. He said, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Everything that have breath. We cry out. We say, I do not want the rocks to praise God for me. Anything and everything can praise God. And I don't knock your praise. God bless you. Open your mouth. Praise him. Yell, holler, clap your hands. Because even in that, even in that, even in that, that activity becomes fanatical. Ooh, we had church. Oh my God, we had church. That's why it's important we have a B3. That's why we, we, we overextend ourselves <laughs> and make sure we have an organist. And what I mean by that, it may not even be in the budget, but I need an organist because the people got to shout. We ain't had church so the people shouting. It ain't about a shout. I love to shout. I love to praise God. I love to have a great time in church. But what's more important is my worship. Anything can work. But it said, if we worship him, we must worship him what? In spirit. It's not my flesh. And in truth. There's a truth. I know who God is. There's facts and there's a truth. I know who God is for myself. Amen. That's why I worship him. That's why I fall on my faith. That's why I cry. Because I'm not crying because I'm sad. I'm crying because I know who God is. And, and it took a while to get to that place with a lot of us. And that relationship go deeper and deeper. And that's why with that anointing, that, that's what that anointing, this anointing cost me something. It cost me something. You got to have a balanced worship. We cannot be fanatical. We cannot overextend ourselves. Worship should be more than just doing everything right. When it's more important to a person that the right number of songs be sung, that the choir be impeccable, that the message be a certain length, we have fallen to what's called formalism. What's really important in worship, it is necessary that they be there and strictly operate because, again, I love order. I love order. But everything, everything is subject to Holy Ghost change. And I don't mean an emotional outburst because you wanted to shout, because you felt like the service was at a low. See, I'm, I'm getting on somebody's toes right now. So now we're going to push it. Now it becomes a performance. One of my friends, unfortunately, passed away years ago, a couple of years ago. He said he had a Caucasian friend. And he said to him, this Caucasian friend who was a pastor, he said, you know, your church is about, you know, your black church is really about performances. And he was offended, but he had to step back because he was a musician. And he recognized, he said, you know what? We do do a lot of things at a performance space. And so we have to be very careful in the things. I love, I love the black church experience. Trust me when I tell you. And I'm going to tell you there's other people from other cultures that enjoy our experience, how we worship and praise God. The energy is great energy. But let us not make that our high. Let us not make that our checklist that we had great church because we praise God. Let's worship him and then let's praise him. Your praise should lead you to worship. Your praise, you may need that praise to get that breakthrough. Maybe I can't quite get through this thing. So let me praise God. That's why I enter in his court with thanksgiving into his <laughs> with praise. So I pray, just come in there and start praising God. Break that wall because sometimes life is difficult. It's challenging. It's hard. Even now, you need to run through your house right now and start praising God. And you praise God, and then you enter into a worship. And I'm going to tell you what, how praise is different worship for me. For me. I can start praising God, and it's all of us, and I recognize we all praising God. But when I go into worship, even though it's a room full of people, a church full of people, it's just me and God. I could be 
I could be pastoring. I could be preaching. I could be ministering. And if worship break out, I'm telling y'all a secret. I don't even know y'all there anymore. I really don't. It's between, because that right there, that's sacred. That's important. When you're worshiping God, there's something going on in the inside. The spirit is pouring into me. He's fortifying me. He's reinforcing some things in me. If I'm worshiping the spirit and truth, that is my real communication with God. See, praise opened the door, but worship escorts me in. Praise will get that door open. But when I start worshiping, I come into his presence. I enter into the holies of holies. I enter into a place where anything and everything is not like God got to come off. So let's understand, yes, our activities are important, but our worship is necessary. I pray and I hope, hallelujah, that we got something from today. As we get back into church, into worship, whatever that experience may look like, whatever it is, even if we continue this way for a while, make sure you have a time of worship. Brother Purcell Robinson, Percy Robinson, who's a phenomenal worship leader and a great, great person, great worship leader. And I love his mindset of worship. And this stuck with me so much that last week when he spoke with Pastor Jason about his greatest worship is in his basement. His greatest worship experience is in his basement. He said, because even though I don't get up there to be performance based, there is still a pressure to perform, a pressure to perform. Amen. He said, but in my basement, there's no audience. It may be some spider webs, but it's me and God. So my worship has got to be pure. If you can't worship God at home, if you can't worship God, if you can't praise him at home, amen, what are we really doing? That's why worship should be easier. Amen. We lost, unfortunately, we lost our people on Amen. We lost some of our people. Oh, there you go. We, we jumped back in. Okay, there was a poor connection. Uh, we got to make sure that our worship is pure. Amen. So we want to just close on this prayer. Amen. Let me say this before I forget and before I have to lose you guys. On tomorrow, there will be a, a trivia question based on this week's lesson and last week's lesson. Amen. There will be a trivia <laughs> quiz and there will be a prize. I have not determined what that prize is. I'm trying to make something that's relevant to what's going on right now. Some, I'm not giving out toilet paper or life, so I promise you, I'm not doing that. But I want to test you because I remember old Sunday school. If you remember Sunday school, part of Sunday school, the way we did it, at the end, they were, everybody was finished their classes. Then they would come up to the top and they would do a review of Sunday school. They would do a review of Sunday school. Amen? And, and so what we want to do tomorrow, we're going to have a review. I'm going to put it out there. I'm going to coordinate with our Minister Yolanda. We're going to put it out there. And then the first person who answers back correctly, I think it'll be about five or six, maybe seven questions correctly, the most in certain time frame, will win this prize. It's probably going to be a gift card, something we can send to your house because I'm not dropping it off. Amen? Amen? We're going to do that to keep this engaging, keep this interesting as well. And it's our prayer that you got something out today that God has touched your heart and made you consider some things as well. Some things we take for granted, and even during this time of quarantine, that we reconsider some things and we realign and reprioritize our lives in the busyness. I know it's done it for me. Do some things that's gonna help you. Get an accountability partner. Get some way where someone's holding your feet to the fire, amen? Father, we thank you for this time of worship, this time of gathering. We thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ, who made the ultimate sacrifice and gave his life that we may have life eternally. And Father, we thank you for every person who joined us today, whether it's for five minutes or the entirety of the broadcast. We thank you for them and their household. We're praying for them right now, God. And Father, as we're going through this crisis, this challenging time, we're praying right now for those who are sick, those who are suffering, those who are having difficulties right now. And we're also praying for those who have lost loved ones. And Father, we're giving a special prayer today for the Brewer family, God. God, our heart is broken and is shattered in many pieces, and only you can heal it. God, it is beyond our imagination the things that are taking place. But God, in this time, this time more than ever, we're leaning and dependent on you, God, for strength. We need you, Father, to help us. If you don't help us, Father, we can't be helped. Our trust and our hope is in you and you alone, God. We thank you, God, for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. Continue to work in our hearts and our mind that we understand what is important to you, what is necessary in this hour, God. Father, we thank you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everyone say amen, amen. And amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. I love you all. Take care. And I'll see you tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.